Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. And welcome, everyone, to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this weekly podcast focuses on discussing practical tips and techniques that we can use in life to find inner peace and happiness. If you have any suggestions for topics, let me know through social media, this site, or email. My contact information is found at my website, lifesjourneyblog.com. In this episode... I'm pleased to be joined by a fellow life coach from California, Brendalyn Tebow. We have titled this episode, Overindulging as a Form of Numbing. Brendalyn shares with us her struggle with eating as a means of numbing parts of her life, and how she eventually learned to cope with life in a healthy manner. In this episode, we examine the role of pain in our life, and how we can learn and grow from our individual pain experiences. Glad to have you uh, here with me. Yeah, you as well. Thanks so much for having me. It was definitely my pleasure. I uh, was very uh, interested in the work that you're doing when uh, I found you through Instagram and started uh, following what you're posting and what you're doing. And... uh, uh, one of the things we can probably plug at the end is, is your upcoming uh, training seminar uh, up in September. But um, yeah, so maybe just kind of share with us what you're doing and what's happening uh, over in your world. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Brandilyn, and I'm a life coach, a speaker, and a writer. And how I started out in this whole world is that. I um, I used to be in the fashion industry. I used to um, do a lot of modeling, and I, during that time, developed an eating disorder, which was very difficult for me to overcome. Um, so I went through a series of personal development and started meditating, doing yoga, getting coaching, going to therapy, and through my own journey towards healing, I started to have an awakening where I saw that my eating disorder was just like a mirror that was reflecting back to where I was at and that it was something that really needed my attention. Um, And so it was like this alarm clock that was awakening me to the fact that I wasn't really living true to myself. Uh, What I saw about that was that um, through my depriving myself of food, I was actually just taking my attention away from a lot of the um, the more deep-rooted issues that were more difficult for me to look at. So my psyche cleverly developed kind of a cop-out strategy where it would focus all its energy on depriving, on trying to be skinnier, on exercise, on counting calories, and the voice of my inner critic essentially just drowned out everything else that really needed my attention. So it wasn't until I was able to look underneath the voice of that inner critic that I could start dealing with what was at the root of it. So my own journey, I started um, assisting others along this same path, and I soon recognized that this is very much not exclusive to eating disorders, but developing another obsession or developing something in which we overindulge, as you put it, is really just a way to distract ourselves from what truly needs to be addressed. Um, So through working with numerous different clients and doing workshops, I realized that an eating disorder is really just a different manifestation of, you know, a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction, alcoholism, 
anything that our psyches develop to distract our attention from the stuff that we would rather just numb and, and suppress than actually deal with. And, so, and I know from, it. yeah, and, and I appreciate that sharing because, you know, I think when people look at the overindulging, at least from clients that I've worked with, even just people I, I'm speaking with, I get that notion that people look at overindulging and don't think of things such as food and other addictions, you know, that they might look at, you know, I overindulge in, uh, you know, either work or in uh, internet and gaming and things like that. So I'm really glad that you're able to see how, when you combine eating with drug or alcohol addictions, and that's a, a lot of what I've worked with in, in my uh, history as far as uh, counseling is, is people with, um, you know, drugs and alcohol. And what I found with the majority of them, they were using it as a numbing process. So, I don't think it was so much, you know, I want that alcohol as it was the underlying factor of I just want to numb whatever is going on around me or what I'm feeling. So, yeah, I mean, would that be the same thing that you're talking about? Yeah, so I absolutely believe that it is kind of the different looking occurrences on the surface level of the same underlying root issue which essentially from my perspective is that we go through life and something happens where we decide that we have a part of ourselves that isn't allowed we decide that there's like this thing about us that we don't want others to find out and that is a threat to our ego identity to our survival to the way we want to show up in the world And so rather than embracing and allowing that part of ourselves to exist and including it as a part of our wholeness, instead we kind of divide ourselves in two and go to war with ourselves. And our weapon of choice can look really different. Some people, as you said, choose to adopt alcoholism in order to numb that part of themselves that they don't want to exist that's their coping mechanism so they don't have to confront whatever that is or like in my case I chose um, deprivation you know depriving behavior which is the same thing what's happening is we're using something else to distract ourselves from having to really deal with that part of ourselves that we've disowned in a sense So in my perspective. Yeah, and I really like the notion of when you were talking about being kind of at war with oneself, you know, that it's, you know, that battle of what do I show kind of the real world and what is going on within me. And I've never really looked at it in those terms, that that it's this battle uh, within myself and, and how do I win the battle and control the battle. Yeah, I think it's really important for us to to recognize the similarities between all these different things. A lot of times each individual numbing behavior is dealt with as if it's totally its own thing, which of course it is, and each has different effects on our body and mind that need to be dealt with. But I think the conversation of how they all tie together and are fundamentally that same, that same thing is is really important. And and I would totally agree with that, that, you know, I don't think we need to segment out what it is that I'm doing to my body as something very different from another for just the same reasons that you're saying that it's really um, you know, going at war with oneself and it's really, you know, how do I control something around me that seems to be uncontrollable? Yeah. 
And I think the deeper level of this that we're talking about is just attachment. It's the belief that we need something in order to be okay. And, you know, for me, it was the belief that I needed to deprive myself in order to be okay, or that I needed to be thin in order to be okay. For some people, it's, I need to have this drug in order to be okay. And it's just that attack. So, you know, if you go to the doctor's office and you're about to get a painful procedure, they're going to give you um, a shot of something that's going to numb you so that that procedure can happen. And so any of these behaviors that we adopt is really just like that. It's like us giving ourselves a numbing injection. But the, the problem arises when we don't realize that there is pain underneath that needs to be dealt with. And we just allow the pain to persist and just continue to numb ourselves rather than really dealing with whatever the problem is that caused the pain in the first place. So in, in looking at that, what would you think, and, and whether you want to share about yourself or just in general, but what do you think becomes that impetus to be able to find that moment when I'm going to stop that numbing? Because the way that you're talking, which makes perfect sense, and I've I've heard it, you know, said that way often, but at, at what point then do we, you know, be able to stop ourselves and say, no, I'm, I'm going to deal with this? I think it's, a weaning off process that needs to happen. If you have severe pain that you've been numbing for so long and then all of a sudden you cold turkey stop numbing, then the experience of pain is probably going to be so overwhelming that you need the numbing behavior in order to survive. But perhaps the best way to go about it, which was certainly true in my case, is to slowly wean oneself off of whatever the distractor, the numbing behavior is, so that you can experience a little bit of whatever the pain is that's underneath. And then you deal with that little bit of pain at a time, rather than all at once. What do you think? That that makes sense. So, I mean, what you seem to be saying is that we need to eventually feel the pain. You know, like if somebody is going through this right now and thinking, well, is there a way that I can go from numbing myself with whatever into working on wellness and being healthy? Do I have to have this middle part of pain? Right. You know, exactly. So you're kind of saying, yeah, you kind of have to work through the pain. You do because you have to confront it in order to be free of it. And it's the belief that we don't have to confront whatever is at the source of it that drives the numbing behavior in the first place. You know, it's the belief that whatever, there's nothing for me to deal with. Let me just go about my life and continue to, you know, work myself to death, drink myself to death, starve myself to death, whatever it is. Um, but the, the, as, as I said in the beginning, the existence of the numbing behavior is the alarm clock that is there to awaken us to the fact that, there's something underlying that needs to be dealt with. And ultimately, when it's dealt with, that's when we have true freedom. That's when we're free of attachment and we get that we have the power to deal with anything that comes our way and only through fully embracing and experiencing all parts of ourselves and all experiences can we ever truly be present to our lives right and that's one of the things honestly that worries me with the culture and society of today that appears to be stressing the fact of we don't need to experience pain or discomfort and if you're experiencing pain or discomfort here's like an easy way to take care of it and, you know, I, I wonder if that's what some of this rise in abuse of prescription pills and the rise in abuse of heroin and, and all is, you know, people are just realizing that I, I don't want to feel pain. So why should I feel pain? Right. You know, and whether it's physical or, or 
mental, emotional, whatever that pain may be, just don't want to feel it. And aversion to pain is just another form of attachment. It's being attached to only allowing yourself to feel a certain way. It's being attached to, to pleasure, attached to the absence of pain. Um, in Buddhism, the path to awakening or enlightenment really simply is releasing all craving and aversion, which essentially is attachment. So identifying anywhere that we're attached to life being a certain way and surrendering that so that we can experience life in its fullness as it is. And I agree with you in that in a society that focuses so much on only allowing pleasure and, you know, you, you can't, opposites are, are like a magnet. You can't have a North Pole without a South Pole. No matter how thinly you slice it, there's always going to be those two opposites in existence and you can't have existence where there's just pleasure without pain um and when we try to have that then we fool ourselves and we numb and we cut off enormous parts of our experience and and to me and and that that i i want people to be in pain i mean i i'm in the job of helping people to find peace not pain but in the sense if we never feel the pain can we ever truly grow and mature? You know, I, I kind of look at it as that's where I can learn about me and learn about life and learn about coping when I have a painful situation and I got to sit down and figure what am I going to do about it? And when I come out on the other end, then I can look back and say, oh, look at what I learned. So if this happens again, I can deal with that learning. Exactly. Like Rumi says, the wound is where the light enters. Or uh, Mary Oliver, one of my favorite poets, says, uh, life gave me a bundle of darkness, and it took me years to realize that this was the greatest gift. It's like what's on the other side of pain is the opportunity for growth. It's like growing pains. And there's a fine line here, and I've, I've kind of struggled with this, because, you know, social justice gets tied up in this. And obviously we can't make the blanket statement that all pain is good, pain equals growth, because then that would almost be condoning inequity, condoning poverty. Uh, But I think from an individual perspective, if we all, and this isn't, it's not like this is true, but it's a perspective that gives an individual power in their own circumstances. The perspective that, any challenge that I encounter is an opportunity for me to grow. Um, So while we can't really talk about this on a systemic level without putting our foot in our mouth, I think from an individual perspective, it gives someone power to, to see that we don't need to create this utopian experience. Really the, the depth and the fullness of life comes in embracing opposites and embracing life's complexity and really diving head on into those challenging experiences. Yeah. And and I'm glad that you had said that because we are looking at this from individuals. Uh, Yeah. So I I wouldn't want to be mistaken to say, you know, Hey, everybody out there who's suffering, you know, enjoy life. Um, You know, but, uh, but yeah, for the individual themselves, you know, what, what do they learn and, and what do they grow? And, and I guess it would be interesting, maybe that's the wrong word, but, you know, to look at like, you know, with, with your experience, how would you feel you would be different today had you not stopped and, and worked on dealing with that pain? Well, you know, the avoidance of pain when we get cut off a part of our experience and don't allow ourselves to be whole, be the you know, two sides of the coin. We're in this argument with reality. We're saying that things should only be this certain 
And I continued to allow myself to sweep under the rug all of the pain that needed to be dealt with. Then I needed to continue to experience um, until I feel much pain. And you know, the place that I was in with my eating disorder was I was singularly focused on on that obsessive behavior um, so that I didn't have to bring my attention to everything else that really needed needed to be looked at. And over time, that just gains momentum. And I would just need to cut off more and more of my experience of life and become more and more focused on it. Because that's how it works. You know, obsession kind of grows itself. It's like a feedback mechanism to itself. Right. You turn and start going in the other direction and allowing more of our experience and witnessing with identity and protected parts of ourselves, then we're going to end up being obsession So what do you think contributed to your ability to look at the world differently, to, to be able to say, I'm now, or I, I don't want to anymore numb this, but, but I, I want to face this head on. I, what what do you think stopped you from just continuing on in in this numbing type of way? It was just, I think it was getting that it wasn't worth it. Getting that whatever I was trying to prove, my eating disorder, however I was trying to prove that these rejected parts of myself didn't exist. You know, how I was I was essentially trying to prove to the world that I was that I was strong, that I was in control, that I was like the master of myself because I'd had experience in the past where I didn't feel that that was true. So I was overcompensating. And I think there came a point, kind of a line in the sand where I realized that I'd given up my life in exchange to prove something. There's no way to even prove. Um, And I had just gone so far deep that I realized it wasn't, it wasn't worth it. And that I would rather other people think that I was out of control. I would rather, you know, other people think that um, I was weak, whatever they were going to think than just not experience life anymore. You know, I, I would rather have a bonus of experience and be at peace with myself and not be aware of myself anymore than get whatever gratification I was getting out of out of my deprivation. Um, and I think that point comes for a lot of people. Do you think in, in your experience with... Um, drug and alcohol counseling, you find that people kind of reach a point where they just realize it's not worth it anymore. That's usually what begins to bring people, uh, you know, into the treatment and, and trying to get out of it is that they begin to realize that the way they were living really wasn't worth living or, as you were saying, it, it really wasn't working for them anymore. And whatever they were trying to either numb or to avoid or get away from still ended up catching up with them. Right. So in the catching up, they they started, you know, saying, well, if this isn't working and and my life isn't getting any better, maybe I need to try something else. Right. Yeah. And it's a trade-off, I think. It's like, all right, you know what? You can either live your life numb to the pain and also numb to true joy and true peace with yourself, or you can live your life allowing everything, allowing all experience, 
and being willing to bear witness to the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the wonderful and the blissful. It's, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't really experience true peace and true fulfillment and true joy and be numb to the pain and numb to the really challenging, difficult, suffering, confronting stuff that you have to face. You know, it's, there comes a time when you have to make a choice and either allow mm-hmm. everything or continue to be numb. Right. And I really think that that's that pivotal moment when people need to realize that there is help and there's others who can guide them. Because I think we lose some people that when they get to that pivotal moment, just go more full force into the numbing. Because that's what they've been doing and that's what they know. Right. And we tend to really think that the answer is there. Like, well, if I just numb more, if I just dive deeper into this behavior, then things will get better. But eventually, I think everyone goes deep enough that they prove to themselves that, you know, it's not coming. That redemption that we were looking for, that liberation that we were looking for through our numbing behavior, through our obsession, is just never never going to be there no matter how far deep we go and what I've noticed is for many years working specifically with addictions but now I'm working with people in general of, of helping them find peace in their lives I've seen it in all of those instances that when you confront that pain and find ways of coping with that pain, they become, as, as you've been saying, you know, blissfully happy. I mean, they, they become happier than they've ever been before. Right. Right. Because they start to really experience true fulfillment that has been cut off for so long. And they get that, you know, it's, it's like... <laughs> If you're in the middle of a race, you you go through this pain and through this, like, trial, this test, but by the end of it, you're full of endorphins and full of bliss and full of fulfillment, and you couldn't have that high, that experience, without having gone through that difficulty first. Exactly, and you know, I've heard from people who run a lot. I, I personally don't run; that that's not my thing. <laughs> but from the people who you know run, will say at that point when you want to give up is when that runner's high kicks in. So mm-hmm. I, I guess it really is that going through that pain um, that you come out on this other end. Um, but I said, I've never gotten there because when I feel the pain of running, I just stop running. But <laughs> that they push through, and, and that's when they find that this runner's high, and they go another however you know, many miles they're, they're running. So, yeah, I, I think it's good for people to know that there are examples in life of times when we're uh, you know, confronted with pain and struggle and... Uh, you know, that we've gotten through other pain and struggles, so we can get through this one. Right. Yeah, exactly. For somebody who's in the midst of, of struggling uh, right now, and, and and I think, you know, more so with eating disorders or, or body image, and what, what would be your advice in, in helping them to kind of move forward and say, yeah, I need help or, or, yeah, I need to change my life. I think my advice would be to promise them that there's something beyond their imagination, beyond what they can even conceive of right now that's lying just beyond that point that they feel they, they can't push past. I, I think the running analogy is actually perfect. I, I remember I was training for a half marathon about a year ago, and I I wasn't a runner up to that point. So the most that I could run at any time was six miles. 
And so day after day, I would run on the same loop, this, these same six miles. And it was so uncomfortable for me that I really had it. Like I couldn't push past that. But then one day I decided that I was going to run 10 miles that day and that however hard it was, whatever difficulty I experienced, I was, I was going to push through it. And it was crazy because as soon as I got beyond the bend of the six mile mark that I usually turned around at, literally I went like a hundred feet further than I had gone for the weeks beforehand. And there was this beautiful estuary right around the corner from where I'd I'd been stopping myself. And it was just like this vast, expansive, beautiful lake with these birds swimming in it and the sun setting and just this wide open, lush area. And I had no idea that it was there for the weeks that I'd been running and training. And it was literally just on the other side of my company. Nice. So I think, and you know, you can't, <laughs> everyone has to figure that out for themselves. Um, but I, I just try to, with the clients that I work with, I try to instill as much confidence as possible in them that they have what it takes to to witness the pain with equanimity. And it's not forever. As soon as we can fully embrace a painful experience, it's it's no longer painful. It's just what it is. You know, it's just like out of mm-hmm. moving. It's just vibration. It's just it, it kinda like dissolves itself as soon as we surrender our resistance to it. Um, what amplifies the pain and suffering is resistance. You know, whatever you resist persists. So anyone who's in that place of hanging on to their numbing behavior and believing that it would just destroy them to let go of that numbing behavior, I would just try to tell them that what's on the other side of it, if they're able to actually witness the pain with equanimity, is so, so, so beyond worth it. Uh, I couldn't even imagine your feeling when you happen to see that beauty that was always there, but you had no idea it was there. Right. I couldn't even imagine. Exactly. I know. I know. That's... I just stopped dead in my tracks and was like, oh my goodness, all this time, this is right here. And, and that's really uh, the perfect analogy, I think, you know, for people. I, I appreciate you sharing that because, you know, I, I think for a lot of us, that analogy holds true. You know, we are right at that precipice. You know, right beyond that is is what we're looking for, and, and we're just not there. We're not seeing it, and and if we don't see it, then we believe it doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and it's it's difficult to believe something exists that you can't see. So sometimes that's why you need someone else to give you that sight, someone that you trust enough to know that if they say it's there then it's there and i'm just going to blindly go forth and 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 trust that there is something on the other side of this it's not just pain and hardship Mm -hmm. and and i do think that's one of the reasons that a lot of self-help type groups work because if you can get in to a group of other people who have been where you currently are, but they've made it into, you know, those extra 100, you know, whatever to see, you know, that beauty, then that should confirm for you that it is possible. It's not just somebody saying something, but you have a room of people who have been there and now aren't there, and you can witness that. Right. Yeah, I think that's crucial because... When you're deep in the thick of it, you're you're blind to what's on the other side of it. You need to be able to close your eyes and just surrender to something that you trust. So in your work, uh, are you dealing primarily with eating disorders, or are, are you broader than that? What, what, what are you specifically working with people on? Yeah, I, I am broader than that. I 
specify in eating disorders and body image issues, but as we've been talking about on this call today, it's all the same thing. And so the curriculum that I initially developed to work with people with eating disorders and body image issues that I'm now realizing is just as effective, if not more effective, with a lot of the other clients that I work with who Mm -hmm. have these fundamental belief systems that they can't have the lives that they want and they don't deserve um, to create the life that they would desire. And, you know, it's just so broadly applicable. So now I really work with anyone who's ready to make peace with themselves and start living a creative life that they love. And and that's awesome because that to me is what living is all about. And I think we all can do it. We just at different times in our lives need someone to guide us along that path. And that's how I've always looked at counseling and coaching is we're just, you know, I'm there to guide you to where you can find your own you know, happiness and peace and and a healthy living. Yeah, exactly. And I think that none of us is beyond that. A lot of people think of having a life coach or having a therapist or having a mentor or a committed listener as something that people need if they're weak or if they have problems. But Mm -hmm. really, none of us is expanded to our full potential. For every single individual, there's always a next level and... I see it as so crucial to have someone who really gets what you care about and gets what your commitments are and can help lead you in that direction. Every, everyone's perspective is limited. So having somebody else who can listen from your commitment to whatever you're dealing with can just make a world of a difference no matter how incredible and strong and successful you are. Right. And and that is so very true, you know, that I've always encouraged other counselors to seek counseling from time to time, you know, because as you say, we we all need guidance, we all need, uh, you know, a sounding board or whatever it may be, uh, you know, just to help ourselves, uh, you know, in, in, in our lives. So, you know, yeah, it's not just... Um, yeah, a weakness. Actually, I think it's it's a strength. But I think the weaker thing is to sit back and do nothing. You know, that it's, it's the strong ones who can, you know, reach out to somebody and say, I need help, or can you guide me, or, you know, whatever it is. To me, that that's a strength. Right. Yeah, it's a strength of, or it's a, it's a um, signal of strength when you recognize that you have a limited perspective and that you ask someone else mm-hmm. to challenge your own beliefs that you have about yourself and to challenge your perspective and the way you see things. Yep, totally agree. So kind of in, in wrapping up uh, you know, our, our talk on, on this topic, is there anything that you want to say that hasn't been said and anything to summarize this? Because I, I want to make sure we've covered it for people who are listening and and kind of struggling with their own lives. Yeah, you know, I think we got it. Um, I think we we conveyed the message that it's important for each of us to look within and just check and see where we have parts of ourselves that we're not allowing to be fully expressed and what we're doing in order to suppress that part of ourselves and to numb and what we're pushing under the rug, what are we not willing to deal with, and recognizing that anytime someone's willing to face whatever that is and really embrace it head on, um, there's growth to be had, and there's something that we can't even imagine that's on the other side of it. Exactly. And and, uh, I really appreciate you know, you're sharing and, and what you're doing on, on, you know, your website and social media and all, because I, I really like the fact that people can see that there's hope. And yeah. as you've mentioned, it, it's possible. You've been there, you've done that, you've come out on the other end. And I think that that's so important 
so that it's not just someone talking or academic, but it's real. So I, I really appreciate you know you willing to share about yourself and, and just put it out there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Chris. This was wonderful. And thanks for all the listeners. I hope that this is valuable to you as well. Yeah, it, it's really been uh, educational, and, and I know I've learned some things on this. And uh, where uh, people who want to get in touch with you, what would be the best way for people to find you? Um, my my name, so it's Brandilyn Tebow, B-R-A-N-D-I-L-Y-N, last name Tebow, T-E-B-O, and my email address is just brandilyn.tebow at gmail.com. My um, Instagram is Brandilyn underscore Tebow. My uh, Facebook pages are, are just that name as well. And you can find information about my upcoming retreats, my coaching, and everything on my website, which is www.brandolintebo.com Perfect and uh, you do have one of those sessions coming up somewhat soon in September right? I do yeah I have a, a healing women's retreat September 9th through 11th which is about exactly what we've been talking about it's about taming your inner critic and seeing what's on the other side of whatever it is that we're not embracing about ourselves so it's really an entire weekend devoted to embracing our fullness, honoring all parts of ourselves, and reconnecting to ourselves and others through meditation, yoga, coaching, dancing, journaling, cooking, all creative therapy to really connect. Excellent. So if uh, you know, people who are listening want to actually work this and, and get to know more about you and, and get into a group of people, you know, I, I really suggest to uh, everybody get over to your website, check that out, and uh, hopefully they can sign up and, and go and participate. That, that sounds awesome. Well, thank yeah. you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll talk soon. I would like to hear from all of you about your experiences and thoughts on this topic. Please leave a comment on this site or go to my website for access to all of my social media links. I hope you found this episode helpful, and if so, spread the word by sharing with and telling your friends about this podcast. I encourage you to rate this podcast on iTunes or whichever service you use, as your ratings help to make this podcast more visible to others. Thank you, and have a mindful day. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.